This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 74, the 21st part of the 100 mile history. For this episode, we will go back to 1978 when 24 hour track races started appearing in America. You will also be introduced to two ultra running legends, Ed Dodd and Don Choi, who became the fathers of the modern era multi day races. 1978 was the year when more 100 mile and 24 hour races started to be established in the United States. In 1976, Tom Osler of New Jersey brought renewed American ultra running attention to the 24 hour run when he ran a solo 24-hour run on the track at Glassboro State College where he was teaching. Enthusiasm for attempting to race for more than 100 miles in 24 hours started to spread. Two very influential ultra-running pioneers, Ed Dodd of Collingswood, New Jersey, and Don Choi of San Francisco, California brought their race directing and running skills to the 24-hour arena in 1978. These two legendary runners developed a friendship during that year, which would later result in the re-establishment of the modern era multi-day races, including the renowned six-day race. Dodd and Choi can be considered the fathers of the modern multi-day ultras. This came about as they both gained experience running 100 miles in 1978 and putting on 24-hour races. Twenty-four hour attempts and records returned to the post-war modern era of ultra running in the early 1950s when Wally Hayward of South Africa broke the world record in 1953 running on a track in London reaching 159 miles. In 1967, Steve Seymour, an Olympic athlete in the javelin throw established the first modern era American 24 hour race which was held indoors on the Los Angeles Athletic Club indoor track. It was called the 24-hour last day run and was held annually on Halloween. In 1969, an African-American maintenance worker, father of seven, Jared Beads, age 41, ran a solo 121 miles in 22 hours, 27 minutes on a high school track in Maryland. It was thought to be the best unofficial track mark in America in 66 years. Later that year, Lou Dosti of California improved the American 24-hour record to 127 miles on the Los Angeles indoor track. More than a dozen modern-era 24-hour races on the track were being held in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa before 1978 but track 24-hour races were slow to return to America, but the stage was set for the return. Ed Dodd was originally from Drexel Hill, a suburb of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. His father was a machinist and his mother was a receptionist at a doctor's office. In 1960, as a freshman at a Catholic prep school, St. Joseph's in Philadelphia, Dodd became introduced to running. Dodd explained, That summer, a bunch of us had gone to a a local public high school track and said, hey, let's just try to run around this track 10 times. We didn't even know how far it was. We ran around, we got done, we're all huffing and puffing and lying around. And this guy comes up, Dixie Dunbar, and says, oh, you guys look pretty good. You know, you ought to do cross country. We said, well, what's cross country? and he was the local high school cross-country coach at the time. He told us what it was, and we said, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And then I went to St. Joe's Prep in Philadelphia, and I was sitting in homeroom, and I turned to the kid behind me, and I said, "Uh, what are you going to do? What kind of sports are you going to do? He said, well, I don't know. I said, why don't you try this cross-country stuff? He said, what's that? So I told him what Dixie Dunbar told us that day, and he said, sure, why not? So we both went out for cross-country. Later that spring, he also joined the track team and ran the mile. He continually improved and finally won a cross-country race when he was a senior. His best mile time was 4.57. Since his school was right in the heart of North Philadelphia, the team would be bused to Fairmount Park for cross-country practice and ran on a 2.3-mile course with one hill around the reservoir mostly on grass. 
somewhere around the end of my sophomore year in high school, I got into road races and met Browning Ross and Osler and Harry Berkowitz. And then I started getting the team to go out and then take seven, eight, nine, ten mile runs sometimes. Our coaches had very little or no knowledge of running. And so in my last two years, they essentially let me decide what the workouts would be. And then I would get them from guys I was running with on the roads, Browning and Tom. And those Toms were almost seven years older than me, and Browning was a much older, 15 years maybe. And there were only a handful of people running road races back then. A typical race I would run then would have 20, 25 runners. Browning Ross was from Woodbury, New Jersey and had competed in the 1948 and 1952 Olympics in the steeplechase. He founded the Roadrunners Club of America and was putting on weekly road races in Philadelphia and small towns in South New Jersey that Dodd would participate in. They were usually distances of four to 10 miles along Cooper River. Many times Ross would run the race, win the race, and officiate the race, timing all the other runners coming in after him. After graduating from high school, Dodd walked onto the cross-country and track teams at St. Joseph's College in Philadelphia. He kept improving each year and eventually received a scholarship. He ran his first marathon during his sophomore year and ran the Boston Marathon in 1965. At 5'6 and 125 pounds, he had the body built for long-distance running. Dodd studied mathematics and excelled scholastically, earning a fellowship to Rutgers University to study for a PhD. But after only six weeks, he decided he did not want to do that. He was destined to teach, and in 1968 started to instruct advanced high school math, discovering his lifelong teaching career. Two plus two is four, minus one, that's three, quick maths. In the mid-1970s, he started his 40-plus year teaching career at St. Joseph's College. One of his students commented about Dodd as a teacher. How could you not love a man who made students who were deathly afraid of math feel comfortable enough to let the wall of fear go down and actually learn? He was a great professor who cared enough to explain the same things over and over if you didn't get it. During his early college professor career, Dodd would get up early in the morning to train and would run about two marathons per year. His running buddy, Tom Osler, a national champion 50-mile runner and also a math professor, knew that Dodd would do well running ultras. He said, People who do things like mathematics tend to have a level of persistence and staying with something. You know that you've got a problem and you look at it from one way, another, and don't give up. I think long-distance running requires that same sort of persistence. Dodd ran his first ultra in 1977 at Lake Waramong 50K at Connecticut, which he really enjoyed. The field was a who's who of future ultra-running legends. Dodd finished toward the back of the pack in 7 hours 45 minutes. At this race, he met for the first time 30-year-old Don Choi of San Francisco. Dodd remembered Choi as being quiet and humble. They became fast friends. Dodd invited Choi to travel back east again the following year and stay at his home to run a 12-hour race that Dodd and Osler organized to run on a county track in Camden, New Jersey. Don Choi of San Francisco, California was a postman with a mail route on Telegraph Hill. Running wasn't a problem for his job. He would work his mail route very quickly in three hours, carrying a 25-pound mail bag slung over one shoulder. He was soft-spoken with a good sense of humor, which concealed the fierce competitor inside. It was reported, When Don Choi took a vacation from his San Francisco mail route, his fellow postmen weren't eager to fill in for him. That's because Choi ran through his rounds and usually got finished by early afternoon. He referred to the route as a lot of hills, a lot of steps. The relief crew walked through the route, and the residents complained that the mail was much later than usual. In 1972, at the age of 24, Choi watched on TV Frank Shorter's Olympic marathon win at Munich, Germany.
Choice said, It was almost like poetry to me because I knew he worked at that thing. Deeply inspired, Choi began serious training, even up to 200 miles in a week. At age 25 in 1973, he was running races in Northern California such as Double Dipsy, which he finished in 2 hours and 5 minutes. He ran his first 100 miler in 1975 when he finished the Camellia Festival 100 miler in Sacramento with a time of 18 hours 20 minutes on a concrete sidewalk course in the rain. In 1976, Choi went to Lake Tahoe to run the Lake Tahoe 72 miler, a road race that went all the way around Lake Tahoe. At mile 65, he started to tire, but he was determined not to slow down. He recalled, Images would come up of people who influenced me in the past, so I gave it all I had. He set the course record of 9 hours 45 minutes. The first modern era American 24-hour race on an outdoor track was held on December 8, 1977 in Glassboro, New Jersey on a cinder track in the stadium of Glassboro State College, which is now called Rowan University. Tom Osler organized the race as part of the college's annual Project Santa fundraiser. Runners received pledges and proceeds went to needy families. Seven runners started at 5 a.m. A group of local crazies took part in this do-it-yourself style event where participants, in a touching display of faith in human honesty, were held responsible for counting each of their laps on a handheld counter, which they provided themselves. Wait, I lost count! For Dodd, it was his first 100-mile attempt. Osler also ran, but dropped out at mile 74 because of a leg problem. It was reported, Edward Dodd, a college faculty member, was fighting fatigue and the frosty air at the campus track. Jim Shapiro came to watch and wrote, One wintry night, I arrived at 3 a.m. at the Glassboro track to greet a whiskery ostler. He had retired from the race after some scores of miles and was lounging around in his long underwear and watch cap as comfortably as other men sport a three-piece suit. Meanwhile, his colleague, Ed Dodd, limped around under the skimpy arc lights, blanket over his shoulders resembling nothing so much as a Civil War veteran. I remember Jim Shapiro and Rich Inamorato and Joe Green all came down. Joe Green took a fantastic black and white photo of me at the end. It's the middle of the night, freezing, freaking cold. I'm wrapped in a blanket. I think Rich was on one side and maybe Jim on the other. And every so often I would kind of stagger and bang into one of them and they would keep me upright, not hold me up. I'd hit them and, and stay upright. It looked like a scene from some refugee trying to escape someplace. I mean, it was just, and I've lost the photograph. It was one of my most favorite photographs that he took. In the bitter cold, Dodd was the only runner to reach 100 miles on the cinder oval, which was alternately frozen into ruts and melted into a swamp. He reached 100 miles in 21 hours, 56 minutes, did another quarter mile, and then stopped. During late 1977, Ed Dodd came in possession of an old, dusty scrapbook filled with news clippings about pedestrian ultra events held in the Philadelphia area from 1899 to 1903. A scrapbook that would greatly impact the reestablishment of modern era multi day ultras and 100 milers was compiled by a pedestrian from the Philadelphia area. In 1958, this aged, dying man had no heirs or friends to pass his carefully compiled treasure to. While a patient at Temple University Hospital, a kind medical student intern would sit and talk with this man about his professional running career at the turn of the century. The old man decided to give his treasure to this intern, Vernon Ordaway. Vernon Ordaway was from Bradford, Pennsylvania. He had received a degree from Princeton University where he was a top runner on the cross-country team. He went on to attend Temple University Medical School, worked as an intern in the hospital, and was an elite marathoner. He graciously accepted the scrapbook gift. He then passed it on to Browning Ross, who gave it to future ultra-runner Tom Osler. In 1977, Osler showed the scrapbook to Dodd. 
somewhere along the line, Browning gave it to Tom. Tom said, hey, look at this, you know, we, we're doing these ultra things. Do you believe they would run, you know, six day races and it was all inside? That's crazy. And these were races on 12 laps of the mile tracks in health clubs in Philadelphia. Fascinated by this history that included indoor races in smoke-filled arenas, Dodd decided to research the early sport deeper. Tom wasn't much of a library guy, so I would go into the microfilm and microfiche and the uh, New York Times and Frank Leslie's Illustrated Weekly, and so it took it all the way back into the 1870s and 80s. There would be trips to Philadelphia Public Library, New York City Public Library, Library of Congress, got a lot of good stuff to Library of Congress. Dodd and Osler believed that they had enough content to write a book, so Dodd went to work compiling the history of pedestrianism, which was later published in the book Ultra Marathoning, The Next Challenge. The friendship between Dodd and Choi continued to develop when Choi traveled to New Jersey in May 1978 to run in Dodd and Osler's 12-hour race held at Cooper River Park in Pensacola, New Jersey. Choi stayed at the Dodd home where Dodd showed Choi his pedestrian discoveries. Choi became excited by the fascinating history and started to wish that multi-day races could be brought back to America. The 12-hour race was held on an old 1930s 440-yard oval cinder track at Cooper River Park by the lake. With the help of the Camden County Park Commission, the old neglected track with a cement curb was put into wonderful shape for a race by dragging and then rolling it. The 12-hour race began at midnight on May 21, 1978 on the poorly lit track. Dodd and Choi competed in a field with 18 runners. Runners carried handheld lap counters and the honor system was used. Once per hour, the runners would report what mile they were on. A woman runner, Eileen Diskin of Cherry Hill, New Jersey, recalled, It started to rain around 3 a.m. and it was really rough until the sun started to come up. After that, I was fine. It got hot and I'm best when it's hot. Most of the other runners were bothered by the heat. Troy took the lead at 7 a.m. and won with a very impressive 81 miles. Diskin finished with 63 miles. This historic track would later become the site of Dodd's 1980 Weston Six-Day Race, the first six-day race to be held in the eastern United States in 77 years. In July 1978, Choi organized a 24-hour, 100-mile race on the Woodside High School track in Woodside, California. The track surface was very nice with crushed brick. Dodd went out west to participate and stayed with Choi at his parents' house, where they further talked about pedestrians of years gone by. The Woodside race started at 6 a.m. on July 15, 1978, with 19 runners. Choi hoped to break Ted Corbett's official American 24-hour record of 134 miles set in 1973 in England, see episode 65. Two women were in the field, ultra-running legend Ruth Anderson, age 48, a chemist from Oakland, California, and Skip Swanick, age 36, a physical education school teacher from San Carlos, California. On the Woodside track, the day quickly turned hot. Chris Hammer and Jim Barker went out very fast, reaching 50 miles in 6 hours 7 minutes and 6 hours 9 minutes, but soon burned out. Choi reached 50 miles in 6 hours 51 minutes and took over the lead after the other two dropped. Dodd was crewed by his parents, who came up from Scottsdale, Arizona. He fueled on highly sugar tea and remembered the heat. It was a uh, bright blue sky, sunny day and I didn't use any sunscreen at all because I thought it would block my pores. One of the most stupid things I've done and got wound up with a tremendous sunburn with a blister on my ankle that had to be lanced later the morning the race ended. I couldn't walk on my leg. 
I remember teaching the next week, I'd walk around the front of the room and dead skin would fall out of my pant legs. It was really kind of gross. That's disgusting. Among the curious spectators was a 19-year-old future Western States 100 legend, Tim Tweetmeyer. It was the first ultra that he ever witnessed. He commented, I spent hours watching them circle the track and watching how they paced themselves and what they were eating and how they decided to take breaks. Choi continued strong in the evening and hit 100 miles in 14 hours 44 minutes for his lifetime 100 mile best. He continued on his blistered feet and pushed through fatigue, determined to break Corbett's American record of 134 miles. At one point during the continued hot night, Troy began weaving on the track. His crew ran alongside him, stuffing pieces of bread in his mouth and bumping him if he swerved too much. He recovered and went on to reach 136 miles for a new American record. Dodd finished second and was very pleased to reach 111 miles. In all, seven of the 19 runners reached 100 miles, including legendary Ruth Anderson, who reached that milestone in 16 hours, 50 minutes. That was the second best 100 mile time ever recorded in the world by a woman up to that time. Skip Swanick did not reach 100 miles in under 24 hours, but kept going until she reached the milestone in about 26 hours. A few months later, on October 28, 1978, another 24-hour race was held. It was competed on the Glassboro College track in New Jersey. Nine starters towed the line, including the greatest American ultra runner of that time, Park Barner of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Dodd and Choi also competed. Barner had done some serious preparation for the race, including a 203-mile training run about two weeks earlier from Pittsburgh to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, with no sleep and only three meals. Are you crazy? From the start, Choi grabbed the lead. It was reported. Choi was breezing along at an eight-minute mile clip. He flew in from his home in San Francisco in order to take part in this event, which offers no rewards other than the self-satisfaction and a cardiovascular system like you wouldn't believe. Troy built up an 18-lap lead on Barner by hour 11. He kept his lead, arriving at 100 miles in 14 hours, 54 minutes, 10 minutes ahead of Barner, who reached that point in 15 hours and 4 minutes. But the cool temperatures and a sore ankle caused Troy to drastically slow down and walk. He eventually quit in 20 and a half hours with 113 miles because he just couldn't generate the body heat to continue. Barner ran in a t-shirt and shorts the entire time while the other runners were bundled up. During the race, he drank three quarts of Gatorade, two quarts of diluted orange juice, one quart of coffee, and one and a half gallons of water. At mile 103, Barner stopped briefly to change shoes because he could feel the cinders through the thin-soled shoes he was using. He continued on and broke Choi's American record with 152 miles. The world record at the time was held by Ron Bentley of England, who ran 161 miles. See episode 65. Dodd recalled how tough it was toward the end. The one thing I remember in here, was, I guess it was right towards the end, I said to somebody, time this lap, I'm, I'm going to run. He did. And I said, okay, next lap, I said, I'm going to walk this. And it wound up being like a 10 second difference in the time between my running and walking. And I said, I think I'm gonna walk. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, very depressing to, to realize I could only run 10 seconds faster than I was walking. Dodd finished third with 113 miles in 20 hours. He didn't realize how close he was to Choi's distance and finished only one lap short of Choi. After the race, Barner commented, that he could have run 300 miles and wondered when someone was going to hold a 48-hour race. Dodd recalled seeing Barner later. I remember laying back of somebody's van after the race, and I see Park. He has these two plastic bags loaded with all this crap slung over his shoulder. He's walking like was just going out of his house to his Volkswagen bug, threw the two plastic bags in the car, got in the car, and drove off. The next day, he ran a 50-mile race in Baltimore. 
spent it eight twenty or something maybe. But he had just run 152 freaking miles in 24 hours, and the next day he goes and runs 50 miles. Inspired by the history of pedestrians compiled by Dodd, in 1980, Choi went on to organize and hold the first modern-era six-day race on the track at Woodside, California. It was named Spirit of 80 Six-Day Track Race. Four runners competed. Choi won that historic first race with 401 miles. You got me going in circles oh, round and round and Dot had planned to run the race, but injured his back a few weeks before and was terribly disappointed to miss this historic event. This motivated him to organize his own six-day event, held a few weeks later on August 23, 1980 the Edward Payson Weston Six-Day Go-As-You-Please Invitational Track Race at Cooper River Park in Pensacola, New Jersey. Four runners went the distance and Choi won again with 425 miles, extending the new modern era world record. Dodd finished with 276 miles. Stay tuned for more 100-mile history. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances.